All righty, so we are getting started. Welcome to everyone to another EBFA webinar. My name is Dr. Emily Splickle, CEO and founder of both EBFA Global and Naboso. This is in collaboration between both of those entities. So I'll talk a little bit more about the education and some of those products and the way that you can tie those together towards the end. However, where the focus is going to start is all about unlocking the big toe and how that first MPJ range of motion is so important to our ability to take nice, long, healthy steps or technically two steps makes a stride. So I'm going to interchange step length and stride length throughout this and how that ties to movement efficiency, which is ultimately our goal for movement optimization. Before we get started into that content, if this is your first time tuning into any webinar through EBFA, welcome. My name is Dr. Slickle or Dr. Emily. I'm a functional podiatrist. I used to practice out of New York City. So if you are familiar with my New York City uh, background, uh, I am now in sunny Arizona. Uh, I'm also a human movement specialist. I do see patients still. So just in case if that's something that you are curious about, I see a majority of my patients virtually. Um, although I do see some in my practice in Arizona. EBFA, of course, education company, and then Naboso, uh, you can reference that as well. Okay, so let's get started. Now, a couple weeks ago, about three weeks ago, I did a webinar on walking speed and how our walking speed can be a predictor. It's actually a really good predictor for longevity and really what that shows through this predicting of longevity and speed is understanding what are possibly some of the things that are reducing our walking speed. And one of those is going to be our ability or our capacity to take a long step. Now, taking a long step with beautiful reciprocal arm swing is a really important part of how we maintain a certain speed, but also how we load our fascial tissue. So you can uh, stand up if you want and go through this with me or just kind of think about it. But if we were to take, I'm gonna take a step with my right leg. And as I take a step with my right leg, my left arm is going to swing forward. So I start to get this countering of rotation in my body. Right leg goes forward, right pelvis rotates medially. I do apologize, it's a little bit hard with the zoom camera. Rotates medially. My left arm is swinging forward, so my left torso rib cage is rotating medially. So I'm getting this kind of cross pattern between my lower body and upper body, or it's referred to as a counter rotation. That counter rotation, imagine how that is. Uh, potentiating your fascial tissue from the functional lines on the front and the back of the body. So the glutes into the lats, adductors into the obliques. As we take these uh, nice and beautiful long steps with reciprocal arm swing, you're really accessing those functional lines. Okay. Now, the most common denominator or limiting factor for that is the step length. And the big toe is going to play a very important role in our ability to take that long step. Hence why we're doing this webinar. So when we think about the forefoot, this is where we're really thinking about optimal power propulsion, right? This is your acceleration. This is when your foot is in what's called a rigid lever. And the more first MPJ dorsiflexion you can achieve, the more rigid your lever can become. So if you take a look down at your foot, whether you're seated, standing, doesn't matter, and you do like a calf raise position, that is referred to, if you look at your foot in that position, that's referred to as a rigid lever position. Now, as you go into more and more dorsiflexions, you're slowly increasing into your peak or maximal first MPJ dorsiflexion, Think of each additional degree as shifting your foot into a more rigid, stable position, hence that rigid lever, okay? So again, optimal power, you have to be rigid, locked, and stable, directly correlated to your ability and capacity to dorsiflex your first MPJ, 
Okay. So again, that's that energy transfer stride link spoke about that in forward progression. The whole point of getting of walking is to get somewhere. So that forward progression component. All right. So we're looking at your first MPJ. Now the movements of your first MPJ, this is a hinge joint. It's actually not a uh, as simple of a hinge joint as like the elbow um, because there is some other movements we're going to speak about. But the movements of the first MPJ, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, sagittal range of motion. I'm just going to identify some of the bones so that if I reference them and you are new to this, then it will be uh, something familiar to you. So right here, this is showing the midfoot. If you can see my cursor, this is the midfoot. These long bones are your metatarsals. This is referred to as the base. So the base of your metatarsals the middle of the metatarsal is the shaft, and then these are obviously the heads. So the heads of the metatarsal, all of your digits, these are the phalanges. So you have a proximal, middle, distal, phalange, or phalanx for each of the digits. And then right here, this joint, the metatarsal phalangeal joint would be the MPJ. So if I say first MPJ, second MPJ, third, fourth, et cetera, that is what I'm referencing. Okay. Now, one other aspect I do want to show you down here is these little guys where my arrow is. These are your cuneiforms. So this would be your met cuneiform joint that is actually referred to as your first ray. So if you wanted to understand how your first ray moves, you can actually join me and I'll show you on my foot what I'm going to do. I'm going to just rotate this slightly so I can show you. So I have my foot. I'm going to take my right hand on my right foot and I'm going to grab metatarsal two, three, four, five. With my left hand, I'm going to grab metatarsal one. Now metatarsal one goes down to your metacuneiform joint right here. And if I move that part of my foot. All I'm doing is moving the first metatarsal up, first metatarsal down. This is also called your first ray. And that's me moving the first ray on its axis. This is going to be very important for optimizing first MPJ range of motion and therefore stride length or step length. Okay, your hand has the same thing. So the way that your thumb, we have these opposable thumbs, the way that your thumb moves on its own axis is exactly how the first ray of your foot moves on its own axis as well. All right, so we have your first ray, metatarsal, MPJ, the movement of the MPJ that we are really focused on is dorsiflexion. The amount of dorsiflexion that we are trying to achieve for optimal range of motion is going to be 65 to 75. That would be your textbook answer. The minimum would be 30 degrees. So 30 degrees dorsiflexion in that sagittal plane to allow you to take an optimal step length to load your fascial tissue to move efficiently. Okay, now if you are a dancer, you are wearing heel drop shoes, you have high heels on, you will need to have much more than that 65 degrees. Most of uh, the footwear like that requires close to 90 degrees and even more. So very high range of motion. Okay, now one other aspect I do wanna mention briefly here is if you can see, do you see that the length of the metatarsal? So if I were to draw a line between here, 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 right? So I'm just drawing a line at every single one of the metatarsal heads. That is referred to as your metatarsal parabola. Okay, so that metaparabola. So right here, a normal metatarsal parabola, what it should be shaped as is the second should be the longest metatarsal, right? An MPJ, so in our foot, the longest metatarsal MPJ should always be your second. And then you want to have your first and third met heads and MPJs in line with each other. So you got the second here, and then the first and the third drops down, and then it goes four, five. Okay, so if I were to connect all of those lines, I would get the shape of a metatarsal parabola. OK, 
okay? And what's interesting is certain shoes, I have field ground, so it's, it's a minimal shoe, it doesn't really match it. But if you look at a traditional shoe, the shape of a lot of shoes actually matches the foot's parabola. And it's called a met parabola. All right. So why I mention that is I'm going to go over different reasons of why we lose first MPJ dorsiflexion. And one of those is that the met parabola is actually shifted. So it's not in the perfect alignment that it should be. And I'll, I'll tell more about that in a little bit. Okay. So now to fully understand optimal first MPJ dorsiflexion, we must understand the first ray. Already, already went over the first ray, what that is, right? Met cuneiform joint. The movements of your met cuneiform joint is it goes up and it goes down, right? That's right. Had you grab your foot, move up, move down, move up, move down. Okay. Now the part of, or the movement of the first ray that allows first MPJ dorsiflexion is first ray plantar flexion. Okay. So in order to dorsiflex your big toe, your first ray must plantar flex. And it must plantar flex at the right moment because everything in the human body is about timing. So if there's any shift in timing, most likely you're going to compress the joint versus move through the first MPJ, okay? More about that soon. So here's just a side perspective of the foot. I'll kind of pop more to that in a little bit, but here we go. So this is what's happening. I want you to see this. So right here, Every time we dorsiflex our first MPJ, it's not just a straight hinge, right? And this is something that's important is when, when I get patients or I see on social media that people are trying to get this optimal range of motion. They see someone who has, you know, maybe 90, 100 degrees of dorsiflexion in their first MPJ. They can go into a wall, prop their toe into the wall and just maximally dorsiflex. And they show that on social media. And then people think that that's all that they need to do to improve their first MPJ dorsiflexion. And it doesn't work like that because what happens is that in order to dorsiflex the big toe, your first ray must plantar flex. So where we want to shift our focus is on optimizing first ray plantar flexion. So here we go. Every time you dorsiflex your big toe, it goes through three different steps. It slides, it glides, it jams. Slide, glide, jam, okay? That's what happens, boom, every time you take a step. Slide, glide, jam, you just took a step. Slide, glide, jam, you just took another step, okay? Now, if we look here, do you see this? Zero to 20 degrees, the first zero to 20 degrees is the sliding phase. What that means is I'm just passively rocking towards my big toe. That's it, it's just a slide, right? Now for 10 to 50 degrees, that is the gliding phase. And what's happening in the gliding phase is first ray plantar flexion, first ray plantar flexion. So what's happening is I rock forward sliding, jam or gliding. What I'm doing is I'm not going over the big toe anymore. My first metatarsal is going plantar flexion. So I go up like this, and then my first ray plantar flexes. But because I'm rocking on my foot, here's another image, because I'm rocking forward to take a step, the first ray plantar flexion isn't really down, it's back that way, okay? So I rock forward and then I plantar flex, but I'm going posterior so that I can then get into this position such as the image. And then the last phase is going to be jamming or compression, okay? I hope that makes sense. Now, what this means is that when we try to support and train first ray plantar flexion where that is functionally actually used, is when your foot is in a lever position. 
This is why when I teach short foot, I don't cue pull your first mitt down into the ground because that's actually not functional. That's not where that happens. It doesn't happen when your foot is in a plantigrade position. It happens when your foot is in a lever position, right? So there, the concept of transfer to function is really important, okay? So plantar flexion of the first ray is actually a posterior movement as you're rolling forward into a lever. That's the gliding phase. In order to glide optimally, your joint has to have space, okay? Going back a slide here, your joint has to have space. Do you see, let's look at the second for a moment. Look at the second MPJ, that is beautiful joint space. This is a healthy joint with beautiful space, allowing for optimal range of motion. Now look at the first MPJ on this X-ray. And do you see that this joint is compressed? There's not a lot of joint space. So that means without even looking at this foot and watching this person walk, I know that they're going to have a limitation in first MPJ dorsiflexion. Just radiographically, I can see that. There's not enough space in the joint to allow optimal gliding of the first MPJ dorsiflexion. So it's going to compress and they're going to get limited range of motion. Okay, so with every step that we take and every dorsiflexion of the first MPJ, you slide, glide, jam. The most important phase of these three is the gliding phase. The phase that you get a majority of your range of motion is the gliding phase. Gliding is plantar flexion or really a posterior movement of your first ray. And in order to do that, you need space. Good. Okay, that's going to be our summary of what's really happening here. Okay, so now when you think about your clients and start assessing the different feet and the range of motions and you watch people walk and you're seeing these compensation patterns that are most likely driven because of the first MPJ, I want you to just start thinking bigger, bigger impact, right? What is causing the issue at the big toe? In many, many cases, the cause of the limited range of motion at the big toe is an issue in the midfoot and even the rear foot. So it's influencing the rest of the foot forward. So we need to have optimal midfoot function to have first MPJ dorsiflexion. And what affects the midfoot function is your rear foot stability. I'm sure you know I'm going to talk about pronation here, but over pronation, ligament laxity, things like that. Okay. So let's take a look at this foot here. What I am demonstrating here through these different images is what's referred to as navicular drop or a midfoot pronation. So this individual isn't just over pronating in the rear foot and the subtalar joint and the ankle, but their navicular, their midfoot has lost its stability most likely because of ligament laxity. And what is happening is it is dropping. As you can see right here, I feel like this is the best picture right here. I'm on B, little B, left foot, right? So yes, I can see this curvature. Okay, that's the overpronation. But I want you to go where my arrow is and focus more on that midfoot, right? Right here, as that navicular drops, it's going to destabilize the metacuniform joint, meaning that the timing of the gliding phase and that posterior plantar movement of the first ray is going to be shifted and they're going to jam the first MPJ. And when they jam their first MPJ, it's gonna cause pain, compensation, and they're going to shorten their step length. Okay, makes sense? Okay, so what do we do? I'm gonna take a step back on this slide here. So let's see if you have this in your client. And uh, for the sake of you know a one hour webinar, this is hard to dive in very deeply, but where I'm looking at this midfoot ligament laxity, navicular drop instability, this is where I know a lot of 
those who are tuned in are going to say, okay, should I then strengthen the foot or should I look at orthotics, right? Which way do I go or could I do both, okay? So here's where I usually look at this as a functional podiatrist. I'm 100% an advocate of strengthening the feet. However, I actually do though dispense and prescribe orthotics in many, many cases. Now this doesn't mean hang up the webinar and don't ever follow me on social media. But what it means is just hear me out for a second on understanding the true impact that ligament laxity has on the foot, specifically the midfoot. Now your midfoot is your talonavicular joint. I'm gonna go back to my X-ray here, okay? This right here, talonavicular joint, that's where a lot of people have this ligament laxity. There is something, a ligament right here, it's running underneath here where my arrow is, and it's called a spring ligament. And it literally runs underneath your navicular bone and your talus. And what happens is if it starts to become too lax, some people it tears, things like that, it literally allows that talonavicular joint to drop. It's like you, you tore your ACL, right? There's no amount of muscular strength that you can create to override a torn ligament like that. This is just straight physics, right? So in that case that I see in certain individuals with midfoot ligament laxity and a drop, I may suggest orthotics in combination with corrective exercise, but I might suggest those orthotics because I need to replace that torn, degenerated, lengthened, or weakened spring ligament. Okay. So it's just something I want you to kind of understand and be able to differentiate and know, okay, which clients can I recommend straight up short foot, intrinsic foot to core glute strengthening, and you're going to see awesome results. And then others where we need to pull in just a little bit extra support, mechanical or artificial, just because of exactly what I had said. Okay. So that's where I may, if I'm starting to see a little bit of that ligament laxity. Maybe I suggest something over the counter arch support, short foot, teach them to find neutral. We're going to go into this, activate foot to core lift, strengthen those glutes, and then maybe I get them in a really good place. Okay. Now, in addition to the jamming that can occur in the first MPJ with midfoot instability, what also happens is when you lose stability at that metcuniform joint is you can start to get a loss of transverse plane stability in the joint. So not only do we lose sagittal plane stability, but now we lose transverse plane stability. And transverse plane stability in the foot is going to create our bunions. So this is where our bunions come in, okay? So bunions are a lack or loss of midfoot stability. Oftentimes it is related to ligament laxity. If you look at the picture here, the x-ray, right? So we can see right here, you know that there's going to be some instability happening here at the met cuneiform joint. Do you see what's actually happening is that first metatarsal is swinging out. So the bump, the bump of a bunion is the metatarsal head and it's that prominence of the head because of that instability allowing that metatarsal to swing out. And then of course you have adductor tendons on this side, which pulls the toe inward. But a bunion this size, hands down, has ligament laxity at the metcuniform joint, okay? Now from a first MPJ issue, what's happening at the first MPJ here is that you've obviously lost centration of your big toe. If your big toe is not centered, that means it's not on its cartilage. So this joint and this joint, if they're not aligned and you're off of the cartilage, you are now opening up the opportunity to create arthritis. 
And as arthritis starts to form, you start to lose your joint space. And remember, the space is required for the range of motion and that gliding phase. Okay, so we, we start to see how this can open things up. So for someone to have a bunion and arthritis in the big toe totally makes sense, right? Because of the correlated loss of centration and the acceleration of arthritis. Okay, I hope that makes sense. All right. So again, our concern of bunions is joint health or arthritis. That arthritis is going to just tighten the joint and then you lose that range of motion. And then, of course, when you have bunions, you start to lose some of your digit function and alignment, which can contribute to lack of stability. In the walking longevity webinar that I did, a huge part of it, of what slows people down from walking quickly, is they lose single leg stability. When you have bunions, you start to lose single leg stability. So it's just another reason of where a first MPJ issue can cause an issue in walking. And in this case, walking speed because of balance. All right, so preventing and managing our bunions, what are we going to do? Of course, you could use toe spacers, right? Uh, part of managing bunions is managing the midfoot instability. Do they need orthotics? Maybe, right? Maybe they do. It's, it's an individualized thing by understanding the foot. Teaching them to find neutral. So how do they set their base? Okay, this is a very important step. I'm going to go through that in just a moment. And then we want to strengthen our intrinsics because that's an important part of our basic foot posture. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you just real quickly how I explain setting the base to my clients or to patients and then how to activate the foot through short foot and a forward lean. Okay, so I'm going to move the camera and this is where, so if you're joining me or your client were to go through this, this is where you would actually want them to have their toe spacers on during this exercise. Okay, so I'm going to take the camera, I'm just going to move this, rotate this here. I'm going to slide this down here and you're going to see my feet because that's going to be the focus of what I'm seeing. I'm speaking on. So first step, let's say maybe I slide on my toe spacers. That would be great. And then I'm going to step one, learn to find neutral and to set my base. So part of setting your base is that you want to understand a neutral arch position. Many times in cases of what's called functional hallux limitus or a bunion, or jamming at the first MPJ is that the client is standing like this. So they're unlocked, right? They might also be turned out a little bit. So it's, there's over pronation. So I want them to understand that as they over pronate, not only am I destabilizing the rear foot, but my navicular dropped and I just destabilized my metacuniform joint right here. So to help them to find a neutral arch, I want them to just kind of go back and forth between the outside of the foot and then the inside of the foot, right? And they're just thinking of this, this is technically the frontal plane, right? But they're just gonna roll in and then roll out. Roll in is eversion, roll out is inversion. So they're just thinking of it kind of like this simple um, frontal plane, single plane movement like this. Okay, now what I want them to also start to appreciate is that every time they roll the foot in or roll the foot out, that something happens in the knees. And if I put my hands on my hips, it's going to continue all the way to my hips. So there is a eversion internal rotation joint coupling to my hips, and then a inversion external rotation coupling also all the way to my hips. So part of finding a stable base and finding neutral in a overpronated ligament lax foot is for them to understand to go from this to this is that there is an external rotation and I'm just kind of exaggerating it that is happening in my hips. And I want the correction to come 
from the hips. I don't want the correction to come from the foot because then people oftentimes overcorrect or they think about just tearing the ground apart. So if you think there's a piece of paper and you just tear the ground apart, that's actually not the correction or cue that I give people. I want them to feel the rotation into the hips. Okay, so let's just take that, put it to the side right now. Okay, stand with your feet shoulder width apart. Find your foot tripod. So your foot tripod is the first, the fifth, the heel. Lift the toes, spread them nice and wide. Or if you have the toe spacers on, they're already spread nice and wide. Place them down onto the ground. And now if you are an overpronator or have navicular drop, then you're just going to do a little extra external rotation into your hips to get your foot into a neutral arch to get a little bit of lift and stability. Now we're going to go immediately into the activation of our intrinsic. So we want to have our toes connecting to the ground. So I'm going to have you stay exactly as you are. Hands are by your side. You're going to imagine that you're standing nice and tall, stiff as a board. And then you're going to gently rock your body forward, just a slight lean. And then you're going to go back into a vertical position. Lean your body forward. And then back to a vertical position. Again, you're stiff as a board. You're not flexing at the hips. Do one more time. Shift forward. And then shift back. Anytime you shift your body forward, you should feel and maybe even see that my toes are pushing down into the ground. And then I come back into a vertical position. That is a very good, easy intrinsic activation. Could you just have them stand with their feet shoulder width apart, push the toes down, hold for five seconds, release, push the toes down, hold for five seconds, release? Sure. Do you want to do Push the toes down, shift to a single leg, and then hold for 30 seconds. Sure, you could do that. And then same thing, set your base, connect your toes to the floor, opposite leg lifts, hold for 30 seconds, come back down. Okay, so there's a couple different ways that you can start to bring intrinsic activation into your client programming. Woo. Okay. All right. So this is how I start to work with my bunion patients. Of course, connect to your core, to your glutes, etc. All right. Excellent. Okay. So Bunions are, of course, something that so many people have questions of. I actually did a webinar all about bunions. So if you want that, definitely check that out. Head to the YouTube, um, EBFA YouTube channel to get that. Okay. So I just want to pause for a second, kind of recalibrate where we're all, where we are. We understand the mechanics of the first MPJ, what's all involved, how the stability and the timing of your rear foot and midfoot influences that big toe. And then we went into those bunions, right? Those bunions can contribute to that. What causes a bunion? How do we start to create balance in a bunion? Okay. Now, the next question is what a bunion is not. Now, a bunion is not, or if it's not a bunion, what is it? Maybe that's really how I should be asking the question, right? Okay. What else could be contributing to issues at the big toe that's limiting my step length and my movement efficiency? Okay. We need to talk about hallux limitus, hallux rigidus. Now, some people like to refer to this as a dorsal bunion. And why they call it a dorsal bunion is because on the top of the joint, I'll just kind of call it right here, that you can see a lot of prominence on the top of the first MPJ, not on the side like a bunion, but on the top. So some people will refer to it as a dorsal bunion. Really, that's just a layman's term. Um, dorsal bunion, the dorsal or top of the bump that you're seeing, that is spurring. And why you're getting spurring is because you're jamming and hitting the bones together. And when you hit bones together, just like I'm doing, you will stimulate bone growth. This is Wolf's law where there's stimulus and tension, you start to get a reaction. Okay, so here we can see on this x-ray that this is a hallux rigidus. 
most likely a rigidus. I'd have to see them clinically, but this is a very, very tight joint. You can see all of this flattening, this spurring, all this fuzzy extra, this is sharp. So all of these are radiographic signs that there is advanced arthritis in the big toe. This advanced arthritis can be very painful. What's going to happen is they're probably going to turn their foot out so they don't roll through the joint because every time they roll through the joint, that's painful for them. So it's something that they're going to start to intelligently avoid. So just something where you want to see some patterns. Now, some of the most common causes of hallux limitus and rigidus is going to be uh, traumatic arthritis. So if you get like a jamming or a turf toe, that can create this. In some people, it could be a long first metatarsal. I'll go into that in just a little bit. Other people could be excessive use. They wear high heels, things like that, that can start to lead to hallux limitus rigidus formation. Okay. Now the impact of hallux limitus or a limited range of motion because of arthritis and premature jamming of the first MPJ is obviously we're going to affect our propulsive phase of gait. We are going to shorten our stride. We're going to turn our foot out. We're going to do something that compromises our movement efficiency specifically in that propulsive phase. Now here, these are four of the most common compensations that people will do when they have a limited range of motion in the big toe. First one, they're going to turn their foot out. So instead of rolling through the joint, they go around the joint. And when you go around the joint, what happens is you destabilize the entire foot. Totally want to show you what this looks like so that you can appreciate that. Okay, so I am here. You can see that if I'm walking and instead of going through my joints, so this right here, what my foot is in right now, this is referred to as a high gear push off position. Now, if I cannot go through my big toe, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to do this. I'm going to spin my heel and then I'm going to push off like this. So if you look at my foot in this position, this does not look stable. This doesn't look powerful. I'm starting to strain all of this. Oh my gosh, look at my knee, right? And so all of that is going to cause a lot of issues during the gait cycle. But that's going to be your first compensation is you're going to push off with your foot turned out. This is referred to as a low gear push off. So anyone who pushes off with their foot like this is low gear. You could think of a low gear push off as an energy leak. So high gear, lots of power, right? I'm moving through my rigid lever, turned out, boom, I just lost some of my energy and I'm abducting into that joint even more. Also, I might just shorten my step or shorten my stride. Again, we'll just kind of interchange that, right? If I can't take that big step, I'm gonna move my feet together, shorten that step, or I might actually become what's called a propulsive. So instead of getting any sort of hip extension when I walk, I'm going to, I'm gonna shuffle, right? Or I might actually march, so I kind of pick my feet up and I enter what's called a, a propulsive gait style. Okay, a propulsive gait is obviously going to be extremely energy inefficient, inefficient, okay, because part of this fascial kind of counter rotation reciprocal arm movement that I was talking about, right, and we're potentiating the fascial lines is that you can recoil like a rubber band through your connective tissue. That's how you create movement efficiency, if I'm not uh, taking steps and I become a propulsive, then, you know, by golly, that is definitely not efficient in any way. And if I don't move efficiently through my connective tissue, how do I move my body? I'm going to move. I'm going to move through muscular effort, which is exhausting, right? We are designed to move fascially, not muscularly, okay? that doesn't make sense, ask, ask, ask. Okay. All right. So here are some things that we can do for hallux limitus to optimize first MPJ range of motion, to keep that step length happening, to keep that movement efficiency. So right here, these images, the top three are showing what's referred to as a dancer's pad, a dancer's pad. I love this pad. It's one of my favorite. So this dancer's pad, it goes on the foot like this. 
Okay, and you could see what it does is it's allowing the first ray or the first metatarsal to drop, okay? Allowing first metatarsal to drop, to shift the timing just a little bit to allow you to get over your big toe. That's what we're going after. What I do with patients is if they find this successful and depending on their foot type, I may put it in a custom orthotic because again, my belief in functional movement and getting people into minimal shoes and not having people in orthotics must be met with the patient's reality, with their situation, right? And I either go minimal, no orthotics, uh, super flexible shoe, or, and the trade-off is that that patient has absolutely no range of motion from their big toe and compensates and shortens their stride. So what benefit is it the fact that they're in that minimal shoe, right? So we need to find the balance between what we believe and what we want that patient to be in or that client. And then again, what the reality is. So for certain clients, we may need to go this way. But having said that, many, many patients, I will put them with the dancer's pad. If it works for them, I teach them to take a Naboso insole, put it on the bottom or the underside of the Naboso insole, put it in their zero shoes or the Vivo barefoots, and then go move and groove in, and they are happy. So it doesn't have to be built into a custom orthotic. All right. Now, your other options is you could get a rocker based shoe. So Hoka has a stiff rocker built into it. This is an MBT, which is much more maximal than I really like. Um, Hoka actually has a stiff piece and many, they're actually kind of this carbon fiber piece that is really kind of all the, the rage and uh, footwear design now. And that stiffness allows you to roll through the shoe versus through your foot. It's an option for Halix Limitus, right? And it does allow them to take that optimal step length because it's not requiring first in PJ dorsiflexion. They're going through the rocker of the shoe, right? Again, it's all about what we're looking for, right? All right. So now a couple last considerations that I want to take here of what might be contributing to it is maybe that client has experienced turf toe at at a certain point. Now, turf toe or jamming of the first MPJ, um, people will associate it with athletes, soccer, football, things like that. But it could be anyone like, oh, you walked and you stubbed your big toe into the door, right? And that stubbing or jamming of the joint created this inflammatory response. Inflammatory responses create a capsular contracture. So you get a tightening of the joint. When you tighten the joint, again, you start to lose that range of motion. The number one cause of accelerated arthritis growth in the big toe is trauma. So I always ask my patients those questions to see if they have that history. Okay. Sesamoiditis, another really big one. Um, if you have an issue with the sesamoids, which are little bones underneath, uh, the first met head, then that could cause some issues with moving through the big toe. If someone is trying to avoid the sesamoids, they're going to turn their foot out. They're going to do something funky that shortens their step length and therefore shortens their, uh, or compromises the movement efficiency. My treatment for sesamoiditis is going back to these guys right here. So everything on this picture here, hallux limitus, sesamoiditis, same things. Same things as how I approach them, okay? Long first met, this had to do with that met parabola, okay? That met parabola, a long first metatarsal means that it is actually the same length as your second MPJ. This is structural. This is a common cause of jamming. So early jamming of the big toe, and that leads to accelerated arthritis growth. So that picture that we had shown here, let's just pretend that this first MPJ was the same length. Let's say it was right here, the same length as the second MPJ, then you're going to get premature jamming. And then of course, that's going to cause issues as we take these steps and our movement efficiency. Okay. So those are just a couple things that we want to be thinking about. Now, as we allow kind of opening up any questions that you might have, last, last thing that I do want to add is one of the things that I see on 
um, social media and things like that is increasing first MPJ dorsiflexion by um, sitting on your heels. So propping your feet, right? So you were, I don't know how to do it without showing you, but you're doing something like this, right? And people will sit in this position and say, sit in this position for a certain period every day. And then they do this. Okay, why I do not recommend this to my patients is what you're doing in that position is you're actually holding under your body weight the compressive phase of slide glide jam. You're compressing and jamming the joint as you sit in that position. It can cause a lot of capsulitis, synovitis, and irritation to the joint. So I do not recommend it. If you do it, obviously your body do what you would like, but if it starts to create any sort of flare up, then I just, I just caution you to do it because I, I get to see all the injuries of people who do that. <laughs> so I just encourage you to maybe be open to not sitting on your feet like that. Also propping your toes up into something, just be very careful of the degree range of motion. Um, Going with your foot all the way against a wall and trying to maximally dorsiflexion, a lot of people just don't have that inherent range of motion. What I recommend instead is to create space. You can stretch the joint, so pull the joint, and you're stretching and opening up that joint capsule that's beautiful. You can do that while plantar flexing the first ray. Use that dancer's pad. Teach them to find neutral. Teach them to do short foot and lift. All of that ultimately is going to lead to a better range of motion of the big toe than just statically holding something and trying to force it like we would stretch our hips to do the splits, right? The concept is completely different from holding a pose to get the splits versus holding the toe to get more range of motion in the big toe you're comparing apples to oranges when you're looking at those two techniques. Okay, that's the last thing. I'm off of my soapbox. All right, here we go. So now it's your chance to get some free education. All right, so we had done this offer through FAI, which is one of our amazing partnerships, but we also did this during our last EBFA webinar, and we're going to open it again. So guess what? It is time for the holidays, so stay tuned. If you want to get some product as gifts, you get some free education. So if you spend $100 or more at Naboso, you will get a free course, a free course. The courses that qualify under that are these. And actually, I'm going to add to this our new neurosensory specialist. So if you spend $100 or more through Naboso by Sunday, 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 which is November 6th, you will then get a free EBFA course of a value of $250 or up to $250. These are some of the courses, our bare workout, feet fascia function, mastery movement disorders, and our pelvic balance. And then add to that list neurosensory specialist, which is our newest, that is an awesome course. So that's the one I would recommend. So again, all you do is head to naboso.com anywhere in the world, spend a hundred dollars in your country's currency, and you will get that course. Okay. Once you make that purchase, just email me and say, Hey, this is my order number. I would like this course and boop, 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 I get you set up for that course. Okay. What I'm going to do now is take any questions that you may have. So type those in either the chat box or the Q and a, again, if you have to jump off, totally understand. I'm going to have these answers recorded. So if you want to listen back at those. Okay. So I'm going to go into uh, these questions. Kat asks, what if my big toe is the longest toe? What is the implication? So cat is actually not the toe length that I am concerned about. It is the meditation length. And to determine that, you would either have to look at a foot x-ray or you would have to be able to look at your parabola. So if you pull your toes back, you can see your parabola. And that's really measuring the length of the metatarsal heads. And my concern would be which of your metatarsals is the longest, okay? Again, just because your big toe is the longest doesn't mean that the metatarsal is the longest. Hoping that makes sense, right? Because in a lot of people, if I look at my foot, my big toe is the longest 
but my first metatarsal is not the longest. My second is the longest. Okay, hope that makes sense, Kat. Um, okay, uh, Gabriel, Gabriel says, Gabriel, sorry. Oh my gosh. Does having a Morton's toe negatively affect the met parabola? Uh, yes. So the way that a Morton's toe affects the met parabola is what a Morton's toe is, is actually a excessively long second metatarsal. So when someone has a Morton's toe, they look down at the foot and the second toe is the longest, but just kind of like Kat's question, what's making the second toe the longest is the metatarsal length. So someone with a Morton's toe has a very long second metatarsal and that throws off the met parabola. It can cause transfer stress to the second. It actually increase the, increases the risk of second metatarsal stress fractures. Uh, it can start to show, throw off some of the balance between the timing between the MPJs. But yes, great question. Morton's toe is a metatarsal issue. Great question. Um, could you please expand a little bit more on the point about fascia versus muscle? Okay. Now, take just listen, listen to the whole kind of uh, explanation of it, because of course, your muscles are what influence your fascia. So when I say something that we want to be moving fascially doesn't mean your muscles are non existent, and they're not part of it. But the energy mechanism to move muscularly. So if I do a I'm sitting in a chair, and then I got up out of the chair. That's a very muscular based movement, right? I'm, I'm doing a power lift. I'm doing a uh, kettlebell where I'm doing a, a heavy weight and I'm going to do a uh, snatch, right? And I'm doing, right? And then I'm coming back down. Muscular movement, different than I'm running and I'm going for a, you know, a 10 minute run, right? Or I'm a dancer or I'm doing something rhythmic and I'm movement and I'm fluid and I'm kind of flowing through my body, kind of like animal flow. And there's this continuity of movement that is fascial based movement. Movement that is fascial based is very in energy efficient because you're recoiling like a rubber band. Okay. Muscular movement is much more inefficient from a ongoing perspective because I'm not recoiling like a rubber band. I'm creating more work output to make those muscles contract. Okay. I'm hoping that's making sense, John, right? But what is allowing us to move fascially is, of course, your muscles are contracting isometrically, so they are always involved with it, but it has to do with where is the repetitive movement occurring, and is that repetition lying within the recoil of the rubber band versus I did a bicep curl, right? I did a squat, and now I'm standing up, okay? Hope that makes sense. All right. Uh, Vita says, please discuss the difference between the slide glide, slide and glide of the MPJ. Okay, remember that the first MPJ slides, glides, jams. There's three phases to every first MPJ dorsiflexion. The first 20 degrees is this passive rock sliding. Gliding is going to be a majority of that range of motion. And what happens during gliding is you plant or flex the first ray, but because I'm rocking, I'm actually moving my foot that way, my metatarsal back. So it is a posterior, well, it's plantar flexion, but your foot is up. So it's posterior movement of the first ray. Okay. Hope that makes sense. And then you compress. All right, Francis, you are welcome. Linda says, is there a functional podiatrist in Alberta? 
I don't know. Um, I wish that um, there were more. What my goal is, is to hopefully, it's one of my bucket list goals, is to create some sort of organization uh, for podiatrists so that people can better find podiatrists that are approaching their patients in this functional way. So Linda, I do apologize. All I can say right now is I do see patients virtually. Sorry. Um, Lori says, where, where do you recommend I begin with Naboso inserts with a helix rigidus? So what I would say is if you have a true helix rigidus, you need to be in a rocker shoe. And I know it seems counter, but I would actually say get your hokas. And within the hoka, because there is more stack and cushion, that's where you want to put the naboso insole in. So you keep your foot active despite being in that hoka and the rocker. So I would get any of the inserts, maybe even start with just the blue activation, put it in the hoka with your hallux rigidus and see if that starts to help you. Okay, great. So I am going to take just two more questions and then we're going to wrap up. Again, don't forget to get your Naboso so you can get your free course. All right. So Amy's question, I just had a chylectomy for what a surgeon said was a 2.5 of 10 helix rigidus. Okay. I'm one month post-op and back to running and do not have it. Do and I do have more range of motion, less pain. I would say about 30 degrees, dorsiflexion, same planter. What type of insert would you recommend for a runner that runs sort of blah, blah, blah? Um, sorry, you guys. And do more rolling, stretching than only. Okay, so very similarly. So Amy, I'm going to summarize your question, Amy. Amy had a chylectomy, which is a surgery where they essentially... Um, surgically cut off the spurs or the dorsal bump of the helix limitus. Okay. And what that often does will create more space, more range of motion, allow her to slide, glide, and jam so that she can move and walk optimally. She's now post-op. She's running again. She feels great. She has more range of motion. So she's just asking about shoes. What I would do is I would, uh, to protect that joint is I would, um, consider if there's periods of extreme uh, dorsiflexion, you may want to incorporate a hoka. You may want to look at these dancers pads and incorporate those if you don't want to go the hoka way. I'd be very careful with um, excessive flexion, dorsiflexion, meaning push-ups, uh, chaturanga, lunges, uh, kind of split squat positions, things that are going to put a lot of load in a maximally dorsiflex position, because it can start to offset some of that surgical progression that you had. Uh, and then anything addition to that, if you just want to message me offline, more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Amy. All right, last question. I have a very long, narrow foot with some fat pad loss. In addition to my heels are small, my ankles um, to my calves. Balance of my right foot is quite challenging. Right foot is a bit pronated. I think I have a good range of motion in my toes. Oh my goodness. Um, uh, sorry, Bev. Bev's question is a lot that I actually need to see your foot. And I don't, I don't give, um, uh, just blanketed recommendations. I always try to make sure that I see the foot. I get the full picture. I really want to understand so that I can best guide you. Okay, Bev. So I'm just going to say, if you could email me um, or go to my website and uh, we'll connect offline. Okay. Alrighty. Thank you guys. And so sorry, Bev. I just, I just don't want to give uh, inaccurate information. Okay. All right. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you tuning in. Do not forget to take advantage of your Naboso uh, to EBFA promotion. We will be doing some awesome Black Friday promotions as well. So make sure you tune in for that. We have some new studio socks. If you haven't seen those, go to naboso.com. They have grips on the outside, texture on the inside. So it's our newest product. And we have a new reformer kit. So do check those out as well. I hope you guys are awesome. And I will see you on another EBFA webinar. Have an awesome night or day, depending where in the world you are. Thank you.